Hello and welcome again to another lesson in PIC microcontrollers. Um, we're going to be looking today at uh, the DS1307 chip. We're going to uh, begin our lesson on real-time clocks since we finished up last time with our uh, timers demo. So in the next type of timekeeping, we're going to look at real-time clocks now. What is the difference between a real-time clock and a timer? Well, for one thing, a timer is usually an interrupt-driven uh, thing that goes on basically as you know like we were described in the last uh, previous uh, lesson as uh, the interrupt timer overflows it generates an interrupt which halts the code wherever it's at it skips to the interrupt service routine performs the task that you've laid out in that and then jumps back to where it left off in the code well doing this is is fine but a lot of times you can lose a lot of accuracy depending on the complexity of your code if your code gets very very complex um, basically time between interrupts and time it takes to execute maybe the interrupt procedure and things like that you're losing you know maybe microseconds maybe even milliseconds would be even worse um, of time in processing time and well that adds up after a while if you're doing th things like you're waiting you're wanting to accurately time keep you know days or, or hour you know or lengthy hours like a five hours or something like that and you want to be able to capture five hours like exactly uh, in your timekeeping well it becomes a little difficult because you've got I mean now we saw in the last episode uh, the last uh, lesson how you can kind of minimize that by choosing uh, uh, different uh, prescaler factors and things like that to get the timer as close as you can but what's better is if you have something instead of it uh, counting uh, as a function of the oscillator which may be you may be counting in microseconds or something like that or is what the timer counts every increment of the timer is so many microseconds or or so many milliseconds or whatever if you really if you're counting in hours you would like to count by minutes you know not microseconds maybe minutes and if you're counting days wherever you want to count by hours you know and not not microseconds so that's when a real-time clock comes in a real-time clock is basically an IC of its own or you can actually f uh, get uh, real-time clocks embedded into the PIC microcontrollers today I'm going to show you guys uh, one of the very very versatile very common uh, real-time clocks that you see that's out uh, that's an external uh, real-time clock that you can interface to from pretty much any PIC that has an I squared C bus which you know, I don't know if those of you that don't know what I squared C is where I squared C is a, is a basically a protocol that uh, is written kind of like kind of almost like like RS-232 or, or SPI or you know all those different interfaces um, UART you know, and all that stuff it's basically just a protocol um, that is uh, widely used another one of those and so it uses the I2C bus, which a lot of PIC microcontrollers have the I. It's either I squared C or I've heard it called I2C, uh, whatever. But um, I2C uh, protocol in it, so uh, yeah, hardware in it for doing I2C. Um, and what this does is that you basically talk to it uh, whenever you want to talk to it, and it basically sits over here off to the side. Even on the ones that are embedded into the PIC microcontroller, it's not interrupt driven. It sits off to the side. I think maybe on the ones that are embedded, don't quote me on this, but I think the ones that are embedded, you might uh, be able to configure them uh, to to generate an interrupt at certain times. I, I, I can't remember. I haven't messed with the embedded ones a whole bunch, or the, the ones that are on board uh, the PIC Micro. I've, I've always just, it's been cheap, and the things I've been doing hasn't required at all to be integrated, so I've always used one of these uh, uh, external ones. And so, um, but anyway, uh, what, what you can do is it's basically over there, you, you tell it, you'll program it with the current date and time either through a uh, user interface, gathering that data from the user, or if it's programmed as the chip is flashed, or you know, however you want to do it, but basically you, you, you basically send a basically initialization command to it and program it with the current date and time, just like programming your VCR or programming your, your uh, microwave clock, you know. Do the, you basically do that, tell it what day, year, it keeps track of years as well, months, um, it has a full calendar in it, um, so it'll do, yeah, minutes, hours, date, month, y month, day, year, you know, week, I think it, it does it does all that stuff, and even if you look up here in the features section that we're looking at, um, if you look at it, even it even will do. Uh, it take, keeps track of leap year compensation. Um, this one is valid up to 2100. So f for you know, 
for the next I don't know how many years. You know, it's uh, you know, it'll be let's see, twenty one hundred was this twelve and twelve. Uh, this will be the next eighty eight years, roughly. You know, you it's valid for leap year until they come out with another version of this chip to change that. But anyway, that's what it does. It, it basically keeps track of all that stuff. And well, it'll just sit over here and count on its own. Um, if we look down here, look at its uh, operating circuit. Over, if you can see, it has its own crystal oscillator. So basically, it's got its own clock. Um, and it, it tells you how to choose, later on we'll see that, how to choose a crystal oscillator so that we ensure that you have very accurate timekeeping uh, on its Honestly, it's kind of like your watch. You know, your watch has a little quartz crystal in it. Same idea. You know, except you, yeah, you provide a little quartz oscillator or some sort, of, some sort of crystal oscillator that's on the outside of it, and then that way you can you can get make this guy the 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 uh, controller the RTC is only is you can f refine its accuracy by getting a really super accurate crystal if you if you need you know just massive accuracy but uh, I've, I've noticed that there's even generic ones that work just fine with it as long as you follow their guidelines which we'll look at in a moment but um, what this guy will do is he'll sit over here and just keep time just on his own he just sits there and keeps track of time and what you can do now is see like it's showing you here the CPU which is basically our pick micro what you can do is you basically just pull it basically you know do a do a do a pull where you just you just basically ask it for what time is it what time is it what time is it what time is it and whenever and that way you get an exact time when you ask for it he's over here just booking along so even though you may be taking up milliseconds or whatever uh, every clock cycle or something like that to run through all your program you're guaranteed that the mi when you're wanting to actually check and see what time it is you're not you this guy's over here just strumming all by himself so you're not going to uh, basically miss anything because he's over here t keeping time on his own he does not rely on the PIX uh, CPU clock and the same thing I think is goes with those ones that are embedded into the into the PIC micro that you actually have two pins that are on the PIC micro that are designated for the crystal oscillator for that if you're going to use that feature of the chip and that's so it can like I said it's completely self con contained it doesn't have to wait on uh, the clock of the of the micro to actually drive its timekeeping it has its own so that's a very very good and so yeah here's a simple circuit we'll look um, at how we're gonna hook our circuit up but basically you've got your uh, your uh, S clock your S data which is your uh, your serial clock and your serial data lines that come in that's the I2C stuff um, you've got some pull-ups on there you got you got and you have to make sure and put these pull-ups in because these pull-ups uh, it won't work if you don't have these pull-ups to VCC so you put these little pull-ups in you've got your crystal um, and you've got your VCC and it looks like they they even pull that up uh, pull the output up as well and so um, and then you come down here and if you notice there's this V bat well what's cool about this is you can actually put like let's say like a coin cell like a 3.3 and I think it's 3.3 uh, we'll see that in the specs later on, I'm sure. But it's you can put like a 3.3 coin cell uh, battery on this thing, and then that way, if you power off your entire system, VCC becomes whoops, B VCC becomes no more. You know, you, you completely power off the system. This battery will keep this guy alive to where he ke he still keeps time, which is very cool. Uh, so you can take and uh, you know have have it's kind of like you know kind of like your backup battery in your in your in your like clock radio or in your uh, sprinkler system or whatever it'll keep the keep the clock alive in it so that way you don't have to reset it so fairly cool it comes in uh, yeah a couple different packages um, comes in the SO package and the PDIP package so it comes in a through hole and a surface mount part um, let's see this of course gives you all the temperature ratings and all that fun stuff and the markings here's your absolute ratings that you have obviously you know how much voltage and current you can push into it and draw out of it and all that fun stuff here's all the timings uh, for like bus free time it's, this is all your timings this uh, corresponds with uh, the I2C bus and whatnot uh, pink pestances uh, here's your timing diagrams here's your block diagram of what's inside of it now it works so it's got some rim it's got a little mux buffer uh, there's the oscillator circuit that your your crystal is going to drive all that fun stuff and then of course you got different operating characteristics okay here we go 
here's where we get to talking about each pin and what they do and here's where it tells you to recommend it recommends a 32.768 kilohertz cri quartz crystal so that's definitely what you want but the key thing here is the load capacitance you want to make sure that you have around 12.5 uh, pico farads is a load capacitance. Believe it or not, they the leads and the terminal stuff. For any of you that haven't messed with uh, crystal oscillators, um, they have a type of capacitance to them because that's kind of how they're made. Is it's it makes kind of like a it's a dielectric, and so it makes it makes a capacitance. Well, you got to make sure that if you have a really large capacitance, it can you know cause uh, you know like slewing almost. It can basically as it's oscillating, it's it's really sinusoidal you know what I mean it's kinda it kinda goes up on on kind of a ramp up sort of you know as a, as a kind of a curve up and then reaches the top and then kinda slowly curves down um, you're wanting something that is really sharp you know to where it's it's a square wave it's making squares it's really it's really sharp you know it just goes up down up down up down up down it's not gradually coming up and then gradually coming down it's a sharp up down up down up down up down and so what they're doing is that you have to have uh, the load capacitance that's on it you can't have a whole ton of capacitance hanging off of it otherwise it'll like I said it'll like slew the it'll uh, mess up the slew rate on it and, and make it where it's it's kind of laggy and so you you won't get good timekeeping so um, that's what they're saying here is that it's designed for optimization or operation with a crystal having a specified load capacitance of 12 and a half picofarads. And you can find this very easily. Um, Abracom, I think, is ones that I've used. Uh, they're a good company that makes good crystal oscillators. And you can find them on DigiKey, Newark, all those places that are in those links on my channel. You can you can click on those suppliers and find uh, lots of 32.768 kilohertz is a very very common uh, clock. It's kind of like a 4 megahertz or a 20 megahertz or something or an 8 megahertz uh, crystal clock. These are real common too. So you'll find one and just and I think you can actually put this in as a search parameter that you want it 12 and a half picofarads as you do it. And so, um, so that's something you got to pay attention to is the oscillator, and that way you can ensure that you have good timekeeping. Here's where the backup battery. He's talking about any standard three volt lithium cell or other emergency source. So basically, three volt, three volts. There you go. You know, and it basically tells you about about the the battery. Um, it's also going to tell you. Uh, let's see. It's telling you about. Um, Telling you about like the uh, the capacity of the battery. So it says a battery, a lithium battery with 48 milliamp hours or greater, will back up the DS1307 for more than 10 years in the absence of power. But that's at room temperature. You know, if it, everything everything shifts with temperature in electronics. So, but at room temperature, they're saying if you have 48 milliamp hours, you got 10 years worth of time keeping. So, that's good to know. Um, and then of course it tells you about this. These are the data lines for the ITC. This is the clock line for the ITC. This is the output, and of course your VCC and all that fun stuff. So that's basically. And then see here again, it talks about the oscillator. Talks about each piece. It's talking about the accuracy, how to make it more accurate. So it's really good to read, read you read your data sheets on your parts because it it tells you so much, especially even the application. Okay, here's the clock and calendar. How this works is this is basically your registers for um, telling you how to access all the functionality. I probably I'm not really going to get real detailed on this right now because we're we're kind of in the hardware connections uh, video. Um, but so we'll probably get we'll be referring to this quite a bit in the software side when we actually uh, build basically the the driver for it or whatever I guess you would call it. Um, basically the uh, the .c file that's going to control this this thing. Um, we'll be looking at this very heavily, but you can see here's your different. It's in it's in a different. It, it's got addresses, and each address has a certain uh, word to it, and so you're basically setting what what each each piece is. So like when you set seconds, minutes, hours, day, date, month, year, control, and then you have a bunch of RAM that's on it as well. Um, it tells you what the ranges are. So like for your hours, you can have one to twelve. And you can have AM or PM, or you can have a 24-hour clock, and it's zero to 23 hours, obviously. You know, for a 24-hour clock. So depending on what you do, and see over here, um, bit six is where you switch between uh, whether you set or clear bit six. It's going to either be the 12 or 24-hour clock. Um, you can do, you can say you want, you know, it's it's 10 hour, or you can say uh, P AM PM, whichever, you know, all that stuff, and that's how you set all all those deals. And then like the day. 
um, you set the day in here with these first uh, three bits we'll set the day um, you know just all that stuff they, 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 that this is basically your whole roadmap for the registers that everything's stored at and like I said we'll, we'll show when we get into the software um, how to set all this stuff up and you, you pick which addresses you want to then change it up and put what you want in and so and then there's also a control register um, this is for yeah exactly this is for controlling the operation of the out pin so you, you set this up that's how you set up your output stuff um, that's pretty much what it's all telling you is how to set up all that and then there's I2C bus data which it's not, not a good or it's it's not a bad idea to run through this and kind of see it kind of gives you kind of a brief overview of how I2C is and how it works and validates because like, it has checksums and all kinds of stuff that happens for the data transfer to make sure that data gets transferred properly and you know nothing gets weird and so and this tells you how to operate and with I2C you can operate a master slave type of deal so you can actually hang multiple devices off the same like in parallel off the same data and clock lines off of your deal that's what makes I I2C kind of a uh, very versatile and very good protocols because you can put things into master slave mode and basically every device like you could have three or four of these clocks or you could have this clock maybe some external flash and maybe an ethernet controller all, all of those that are I2C and they all maybe hang off of the data and the one set of data clock lines off of your uh, off of your microcontroller and the way you access each one is by uh, calling to each one of their addresses and so you'll send basically the address as a header you know and only the one that you're wanting to pick will respond to what you're telling it you can either set or reset the one based on its address it's kind of a way of kind of networking different ICs together through the I2C to the I2C bus so that's kind of cool so that's what this is telling you about you've got you know the slave like receiver mode you got slave transmitter mode and you know and then it talk it'll talk about even the the I think the um I think it even talks about the master stuff because there's yeah there's there just slave receiver yeah yeah and it shows you how how that all gets trans transmitted and how to do it and all that fun stuff and then you got um yeah see there's your data write data read for your slaves you know and um, and see, see slave address so that's where you'll put in you'll send the address you know first as kinda like the preamble and then you'll have the rest of the data so so that works and then you've got um, slave receive transmit and then they go into packaging information and package codes and all that fun stuff so it's a good idea. Always read your data sheets. Uh, th that will tell you exactly how the device operates. And a lot of times they give you really good examples of how to look kind of like this. They'll give you a, a typical, you know, layout or whatever of how to hook it up. So now what we're going to do is we're going to kick over to our drawing. So now we're uh, here at our our uh, schematic here. So we've got our normal input stuff. I actually put some uh, some protection circuitry in uh, just for those of you just to look at. Um, what I did is this is basically a, like a barrel connector and I've got a diode down here on the bottom for reverse voltage protection so if somebody uh, somehow plugs this in backwards like plus isn't on top and minus on the bottom it's flipped around uh, you, you won't be able to push any current onto the ground pin so you can't fry anything so that's for reverse voltage protection uh, this is just for like uh, transient voltage suppression so like for any kind of spikes or whatever this is a uh, a 2 watt uh, I think 24 volt zener so what he'll do is he'll clamp if the voltage goes up to like 30 volts or let's say 50 volts he'll clamp the voltage down to 24 and this resistor basically helps limit the current that is coming in through in, and going through this guy because this guy can only handle so much so it gives him something to work against so and this needs to be pretty beefy too it'd probably be like a 2 watt as well um, and that way it can it can it'll protect it it'll protect your regulator here from being super over voltaged so anyway um, that's that's kind of that little piece right there that's kind of different than what I've been doing before <coughs> but um, and then we've got of course our normal 5 volts out <coughs> Now we've got our PIC Micro, which in this case I'm using a, a 1938 uh, SO, which 1938 is pretty much almost identical to the 886 that we've used in the past. The only difference is it has more memory. Um, this was just one uh, kind of I kind of pulled this out of a, a different drawing that I had what I was what I was doing this with, and so that was the chip I used. So that's what we're using here. Um, we've got our pull-up for MemClear. 
and then over here is where we get to our get to our deal. And uh, I don't know those of you. I, I know I did that video on USB that shows you how to use Eagle CAD and all that stuff. For those of you that haven't used Eagle CAD before, the battery uh, deal, depending on what uh, footprint it has in layout mode, um, it may have multiple. Um, connections uh, like this one in this case the battery holder that it is actually has um, yeah like four connections per side because just the way the battery holder solders in there's like four pads that hold it all in and so um, there's four connections and they don't really show up um, so you got to know that there is four connections, there is four pins, and for some reason they put them all on the same line. They don't, they don't maybe pull out little lines and put the pin connections out here or something. So you always got to know that those are there, otherwise they won't get connected in the uh, in the actual uh, layout. They won't be connected. They won't show that there needs to be a connection if you don't connect them. So that's what all this mess is of all these wires going to the same spot. That's what they are. The ground terminal has four different through hole vias in uh, layout and so they all go to ground same with these there's like uh, five you know ones that are on the positive side so they all go to the the VBAT on the DS1307 then there's our 13 or, or 32.768 kilohertz crystal clock that's gonna go on X1 and X2 and then uh, I chose 3.9 K uh, just because for a standard resistor and that gives me um, a low uh, a low pull up you know not really weak but uh, not substantial enough to where it's going to skew our, our uh, data coming across us because we're actually sinking you know we're pulling more current than we should be so that way we we we, we do that so 3.9k works works pretty good uh, 4.7 can work fine too uh, just all that if you get up to like 10k or 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 20 to 10 or 20k you're getting a little too large you might see some issues uh on the on on the data but you might you might get some errors or maybe not be able to communicate very well if you get these too huge and same thing if you get them like tiny if they're like three ohms you know then it's gonna it's gonna uh, you're gonna you're gonna be take a chance on on damaging either this or that because when uh, the line goes low or whatever you'll get a ton of current flowing through these guys and either into this guy or into that guy and you could take a chance on damaging one of your one of your pins or one of your ports so you don't want to don't want to make these too small because uh, you could damage something and then you don't want to make them too large because you could uh, get your data could be skewed and get off so so I, I say around 3.9 4.75 5 somewhere around there 5k or someone would be great you know it is a good pull up to have like I said I chose 3.9 so but anyway and that's basically there's a decoupling cap for for this guy and that's pretty much all you have to do hardware is actually fairly simple on this guy um, like I said, you just gotta make sure that you have a device that has I2C on it, has an I2C piece of hardware, and since this guy is an I2C device, if, if that's the device you choose. Now some of them, if you choose other uh, real-time clocks, some of them might be SPI, which uh, I think that's Serial Peripheral Interface, I think is what that stands for, and um, you have to make sure then in that case that your microcontroller has an SPI you know has the SPI hardware built into it so you can you can do the SPI data because it's a completely different protocol than I2C so or I squared C however you want to say it so anyway that pretty well concludes the uh, hardware section for this example um, the the software is going to take a little bit um, we may have a few parts to that because there's a lot since we've got the uh, the driver basically the driver dot uh, C file ooh, that we're going to have to that I'm going to have to explain, as well as then uh, we're going to do just kind of a quick uh, little demonstration, uh, main code uh, demonstration for uh, just, I don't know, maybe keeping time, maybe every every 20 seconds flashing a light or, or something, I don't know, we'll come up with something, but um, I, may, I may end up uh, putting a uh, putting an LED off of this, um, just kind of like we've done before, just maybe pick, uh, I don't know, RB1 maybe and pull, putting a resistor off of it and an LED uh, that way you know, like a 470 ohm resistor and an LED so that way we can flip an LED on and off every 10 seconds or something like that I don't know and but the time the timing will be coming from our real-time clock and so I think that's kind of what is gonna steer us toward where I'm gonna steer us and we'll be doing that now I will also I see that <laughs> lots of people enjoy having 
to see as well as I like it as a good check um, to take and actually build it you know, actually physically um, put it together and see that it does work the code that that I have posted that you can download uh, that you're seeing me work with uh, can't does actually physically work you can burn it and it works as long as you hook it up uh, the way that I'm showing it will work and so I think um, I will do another demonstration like that on this so we'll have uh, after this video we'll have the coding videos and then after that there will come a uh, physical uh, breadboard demonstration of this because I, I think I've got some of these parts I think I have all these parts in through hole so I think I'll be able to snap it into a breadboard and try it and show you guys so anyway that concludes the uh, hardware version of this. I uh, hope you stay tuned. I'll be posting the software ones. Uh, they may take me a little bit of time to get together because there is a lot of information. So um, yeah, look forward to that. Until then, happy coding. Please uh, feel free to subscribe, comment, uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, it should be, should be a good time. Thanks a lot.